Do you get confused about what bra you should be wearing after breast cancer? Have you given up on exercise because you can't find a sports bra to fit? Has your relationship with your breasts changed and you're struggling to accept your new shape? Or maybe you just don't know how to check them anymore now that everything's changed. Today, I'm going to answer all your questions about breast health after breast cancer with this week's guest, Dr. Philippa Kay. She's a well-known GP and author of the brilliant book, Breasts, and Owner's Guide. This is So Now I've Got Breast Cancer, the podcast for anyone who's just been diagnosed. I'm Dr. Liz O'Riordan, the breast surgeon with breast cancer, and I found out the hard way just how little I knew when I suddenly found myself in the chemo chair. It's why I wrote my book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer. There's a lot of bad information out there, and I want to guide you down the right path. So if you've got a question, this show will answer it for you. Before I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I never really thought about my breasts or what they meant to me. Suddenly, I had to decide whether to have a reconstruction, and I realised just how important my breasts were to my identity, what I wore, how I flirted with my husband, how they made me feel complete like a woman. And those days of being able to walk into any shop and pick up a bra that fit me were now behind me. And as my remaining breast changed during treatment, I had no idea if it was normal or not. And judging by your questions, I'm not alone. And that's why I had to get today's guest, Dr. Philippa Kay, to help me answer them. And she is a real force of nature. Not only is she a GP and a mum, but she's regularly seen on the sofa of this morning and she's written eight books. But that's not all. She's also had bowel cancer and talks openly about her experiences. So Philippa, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. You're welcome. It's not often I get to speak to another doctor who's had cancer and I know how hard it was for me. Could you just tell our listeners what it was like for you as a doctor when you found out that you had bowel cancer? I was 39 when I was diagnosed with bowel cancer and even at the time I knew I was a very lucky pickup. And feelings are not either or, feelings are and, and, and. So whilst I was shocked, horrified, terrified, I was also grateful even at that moment in time. My children were four, eight and eleven and for people out there who had young children, there is an added terror because you're dealing not just with your emotions but their emotions as well and how you manage all of that as a family. And I was having major surgery and I was going to be away for a period of time and cancer was going to affect all of our lives. And I remember thinking that it's coming for all parts of me. It came for me as a doctor and it came for me as a wife and a mother and a sister, as a friend. And how was I going to hang on to who I was? Mm. And for me, actually, work was quite important of that because in work, it was about someone else's problems and someone else's issues. And I could use my brain to think about something else. So how to hang on to myself when it felt like everything was being taken away. And I... I'm very open about the fact that I had therapy for four, four years. I stopped having therapy this summer, and that's a long time. But I think that it is as important to look after your mind as it is to look after your body. Um, for anybody out there that has children doing this, young families doing this, that you have to be honest, they know something is happening. They know. They know you can't hide it from them, even if you're not going to hospital for 10 days. And that my children would say, mommy, are you scared? And I would say yes. And the reason that I think that's okay is because it allowed them to say, I'm scared too. Yeah. Because we were going to do the hard thing anyway, right? I knew I was going to cry. We were going to do the hard thing <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But we can do it together. And that is what it taught me more than anything, is that you don't have to go in jumping and skipping and laughing for joy and people who tell you to be positive do not understand that we it's do the shit hard having thing. Cancer. Right. And I had the shit cancer. And um, you go in plodding and that's where your strength is, that's where your bravery is, that you keep going and you keep saying, hurt me. Quite literally, put the poison in, yeah. cut me, Pick over, me up, hurt me to make me better. And that is where your strength is. 
And in some ways I look back now and I said, well, my children went through that too. And we yeah. know, all of us know, that all we have to do is just keep plodding. So if you are out there and you've just been diagnosed, that's what you have to do. But for me as a doctor, it changed me hugely. And the way that it changed me was that, and I know exactly when it changed me. It changed me when it was the middle of the night in my first surgery, in about day three or four, when the things were going wrong in ICU. And I looked at my own heart monitor and was afraid. Oh, God. And I knew that the doctor was coming and the doctor was there within 10 seconds. And the doctor looked at the monitor and he sat down on my bed and he held my hand and he said, you're having a shit time, aren't you? And he held my hand. I don't know how long that lasted. I don't know what his name is. But what I do know was that he connected to me as a human, not as a doctor, not as a patient, and he acknowledged what was happening to me. And then he did whatever it was that had to be done. But now when my patients are having a difficult time and their heads are down and they won't meet your eyes and they're telling you about it, that I put my hand on theirs and I say, I see how hard that is. And that I see their heads come up and their eyes meet mine. And I think maybe, or I hope, I've done to them what this guy did to me because doctors can't always fix it. But we can be there with you in it. And that is really powerful too. It's realising that it's okay to not be okay and acknowledging we get good days and we get really bad days and we don't want anyone to know that we're not feeling brave and feeling positive and just saying, yeah, we're going to help you get through this. And for people who are listening who don't have cancer, that you need to hear the person who does have cancer when they say, I don't want to, today is bad. Yeah. And that what we're asking for is to be heard and not, oh, it's only three more chemos or, oh, you know, but you look so pretty or, oh, you've what, got your lipstick on. Yeah, whatever it is, what we're asking for is just for a minute, sit with me in it. And I know why it's hard not to, because if you care about us and you feel just that smidgen of transference of our pain and it's unbearable for you, and that's why you try and make it better. But if you are listening and it's your friend with cancer, just try and hear, because that is what will make them feel better. Yeah, we don't always want to be fixed. We just want a bit of acknowledgement that, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Oh, wow. You're going to make me cry now. See? <laughs> On to the next question. Come on now, we'll do this. It's fun. But let's get back to breast cancer. And I think breast cancer treatment can have a massive impact on the breast and more than I realized. And the surgery is obvious, but chemotherapy and hormone blockers and radiotherapy can all have an impact. How do we know what's normal anymore? There's no such thing as normal. There's only what's normal for you and what's normal for you changes. And it changed from before you went through puberty and it changed after puberty and it will change after the menopause. So what's normal for you changes. And I think that that is a process, especially after a form of breast cancer surgery that takes time to learn what is your new normal. And your new normal will take months to settle down anyway as any swelling goes down. And, you know, maybe you've got expanders in, maybe you know, there, there might be multiple surgeries. So all of that takes time. But I think that something that people often don't think about is the changes that radiotherapy causes. The radiotherapy sort of fixes your breast in time. And it does. So it's not just what it does for that breast. It's what happens to the other breast as you get older. So you might have one breast that feels a lot firmer, perhaps related to the, to the radiotherapy. But as you age, the other breast might sag more or there might be weight fluctuations or other things. And yeah. so actually that symmetry surgery is sometimes something that people ask for later. So there's the radiotherapy bit. Hormone blockers can essentially put you into the menopause and the menopause changes the breast so every single month whether or not you want to have a baby whether or not you're even having sex your breasts get ready to breastfeed a potential baby yeah and the milk producing tissue in the breast responds to the hormones of the menstrual cycle 
after the menopause, when those hormones aren't there anymore, uh, that tissue sort of shrinks. So your breasts become softer as what's left is essentially fatty tissue and a bit of connective tissue. And so if you have hormone blockers or hormone therapy, you might notice those changes in your breasts. And sometimes actually that can make other lumps and bumps feel more prominent because they're in a softer bag. And that then for patients who've had breast cancer is hugely frightening because they already yeah. had a lump or a change that was something and now they can feel something else. So the breasts do continue to change. And then I think even when you talk about something like chemotherapy, chemotherapy affects your skin, it affects your skin everywhere. Your breasts are covered in skin. So dry, yeah. itchy skin on the breast. You know, so treatment definitely has an effect. And all of that needs healing and takes time before you can learn what's my new normal. Exactly. And the chemo can make you menopausal as well. And I didn't realise radiotherapy, as well as fixing the breast in time and place, it can make your scar tissue feel like hard, lumpy soap. Yeah. And you can almost feel like the cancer is still there because that's the radiotherapy scarring in the breast. And breast surgeons are very good at trying to make you look as symmetrical as possible. But as you said, you look symmetrical then. Five years time when your natural breast heads south of winter, whether you've had radiotherapy or reconstruction, you're not going to look the same naked. And I don't think we're great at telling women that your breasts are going to change. And the swelling can take three or six months to settle down. And we can't work wonders. And that's why it's important to keep checking and to keep knowing what's normal. When I look at, think about my patients who've had reconstruction or any form of breast plastic surgery, I don't think the bit about it not being a lifetime surgery has sunk in. So people think that they've done it. But actually, the life expectancy of a breast implant is only about a decade. And so you might be having multiple surgeries as you get older with all the other things that might be happening as you get older. And I, I get it because when you have cancer, you can't see the way out. So you can only see the now, right? You can't think about 10 years time. Who knows if I'm even going to be here in 10 years time, right? So you don't think like that. I understand it. But I think that it's important that we as doctors keep saying it because the choices that you make now may impact what you might want later. Exactly. So when I was diagnosed, I could not imagine not having two breasts. I couldn't imagine not wearing my low cut clothes in a wardrobe. Now, I wish I'd just gone flat in the beginning because I've, my relationship with my breasts has changed. But I think one thing people don't realize is just because you've had breast cancer, it doesn't mean that you can't get breast pain or breast lumps and bumps. And we've got a woman who wrote into us who was struggling with breast pain and large breasts. So let's listen to her question. My issue is that I've had a lumpectomy on my right side where the cancer was and on the left side I've had DCIS removed. But my issue is that I am actually very big breasted. I'm a 42G and I struggle with the pain doing simple things like bending down, sleeping at night round the area where my scars are. And I also struggle getting something like a sleep bra for people with bigger breasts. I think possibly the assumption is that a lot of people who have breast cancer and who have the surgery either have mastectomies or have a lot smaller breasts than me. I just wondered if that's something that you've ever come across and what I can maybe do to try and ease the pain. I want to get back fit, but exercise is just impossible with the pain that I have. That was Paula speaking there. Can you help her, Philippa? I would love to be able to help her, but I have to be honest that bra sizing is bonkers. It is not standardised and it's different in different countries. It's different within different manufacturers, within the same manufacturer. And whilst that lack of standardisation as a scientist drives me insane it does mean that there is the right bar out there for someone and we just have to keep looking so there are things that we can do breast pain is really common and i often think that breast surgeons deal with breast ill health and gps often deal with breast health what it is like to live with breasts and breast pain is really common breasts are heavy they can be big they can be small lots of the pain is cyclical related to the hormones of the menstrual cycle 
which you still might be having if you've had breast cancer. Obviously, then there is the whole psychological thing of what does this pain even mean? But large breasts will often cause neck pain, headaches, shoulder pain, and wearing a good bra is really important. Now, bras started off as coffee cups, egg cups, tea cups, and the bra sizing system was designed to go from A to D. Really? And the further away that you get, the bigger that you get, the less good the sizing system is. So there is no such thing as your size in a bra. There's your size and that manufacturer's bra of this particular style. So I really don't want people to get too hung up on what their sizes are. But having a vague idea of where to start is useful. And so there is the band size, which is the size underneath your breasts. And then the cup size, which is not the size of your breasts or the volume of the breasts, it's the difference between if you were to put a tape measure around the middle point, the fullest point of your breasts, and the area underneath the bust. And once you've got your bra on, one, it shouldn't hurt, but it is neither too tight or too loose. And by that, I mean that you can get one finger underneath the band, but not more than that. If you can get four fingers in, that way it's too big. And that the middle of the bra, which is called the central gore, sits flat against the breastbone. And that the back of the bra does not look like a sad face on your back, that the band runs parallel all the way around. The straps need to be adjustable. And if you can lift your straps way up above your ears, then they're too loose. And we don't want them digging in either. When it comes to large breasts, a wider strap helps carry some of that weight. The majority of support is given by the band, but some comes from the straps as well. And then the cup size. Now, my grandmother used to say to me when I went out on a date, Philip, I put a £10 note inside your bra, so if you need to run away, you can run away. But if you can fit more than a £10 note in your bra, then the cup is too big. And if you've got a quadruple boob, then your cup is too small. It shouldn't hurt. That's the main thing. And then wire under wire is actually a personal choice. The wire is supposed to run along something called the inframammary ligament. But where yours is and mine is might be slightly different. If it's comfortable for you and they do give more support, then great. If it's not comfortable for you, then not great. So I would say the first thing is that I would be looking for a good bra that fits you. And then at nighttime, I would be wearing one. And at nighttime, I would recommend that you tend not to have the wire just because when you're sleeping, you're moving and that can dig in. And I would go and get fitted. And if you don't want to do it in person, you can even have virtual fittings where they will ask you to turn around and see. And you try on lots and lots of different sizes until we find the one that suits you. If you do all of that and you're still in pain, actually something like rubbing an ibuprofen gel on the breasts can be helpful. Or you can always go to your doctor because there are various other things which can do. But this is really common and I see people in my surgery all the time and I have to listen to their chest, for example. And most of the time, they are wearing the wrong size fitting bra. I was going to say, I spent most of my time as a surgeon telling women that their bra was the wrong size. And for a lot of us, our breasts actually go almost all the way underneath our armpit. They are bigger than we think. And that's why underwire bras are small because they're digging in. It's like me. I thought I was a 34A. When I got measured, I was a 30D because my cup size was way too small. I get measured. Suddenly, my bras are really comfortable. And when it comes to sports bras, because she mentioned that too, there are various types. There's an encapsulation bra where the breasts are in cups and there's a compression bra where essentially you squish the breasts down or you can have a combination. So I would say that if you have large breasts there, I would go for an encapsulation or a combination bra that gives you a sizing that is better for you. But the higher the neckline, the more support it gives. So for every centimeter that you go up the neck, the more supportive the bra will be. And then do you remember when you were a little girl and you went to the shoe shop and you had to do the little totter, right? You were trying to school shoes every year and your mum would go, go for a walk. Um, I would like you to stand in your bra shop and do a few jumping jacks if you do jumping jacks or run on the spot if you run. Because if they're jiggling around too much, you will notice that pretty quickly. And breasts move in all directions when you're running. They go up and down, they go side to side, they go in and out, and they can move by about 20 centimetres. So a good bra is essential. 
Great advice there for getting your bras measured. And I think it's really important. Most of us get measured at 18 and that's our breast size for life. And it's really important to get measured again, especially if you've had breast cancer surgery because your breasts are going to change. You may find you need to get a small chicken fillet to put in to balance you. But Isabel wanted to know, and I get asked this a lot, is it okay to wear a wide bra after breast cancer surgery or breast reconstruction? If it fits. And that's the key, is about fitting. So we hear a lot of stuff which isn't correct. You know, do underwired bras cause breast cancer? No. Does a black bra cause breast cancer? No. Does an underwired bra stop you breastfeeding? No. But it's about, does it fit you properly? And is it comfortable? So it isn't a blanket, no. But in a breast which is changing quite a lot in that first few months after surgery, you might be less comfortable in a wired bra. But as long as it fits you properly, it should be comfortable. And it is a marker of the fact, you know, and bras aren't cheap. And it's one of those many things that women pay for that men don't pay for. But if that is what is going to keep you pain free and therefore help your recovery, if that is what is going to help you get back to sport or physical activity or whatever it is that you do, then for me, that's an investment that's worth doing. But you absolutely can have whatever sexy, lacy, underwired, not underwired bra that you want as long as it fits. Exactly. I think as a surgeon, we generally say wait six to eight weeks just to make sure, because we do a lot of jiggery pokery inside that you can't see. So six to eight weeks, all that to settle down, most of the swelling to go for the scar to heal, and then you can wear what you like, but you need to get fitted. And if you had a reconstruction, you may find your breasts are slightly different sizes. So again, you may need a small little prosthesis just to balance things in place, but they are completely safe. But coming back to breast pain, so something... I told all my patients about and never really took seriously until I got it was post mastectomy pain syndrome. And this is something I knew very little about. And Amanda said that she's had constant pain since her mastectomy in 2020. And Jan wanted to know, how do we manage post mastectomy pain? Is it something a GP can do? Do you, what do you know? How can we help? GP is always your first port of call. Chronic pain management actually often does live in GP land. So the first thing is, have you been checked over by your team? Have you been sort of discharged with post mastectomy pain syndrome or is this something that's near and do we need to check that there isn't anything else going on? Is it actually pain from cording and, and, you know, could some physio help that kind of thing? But in post mastectomy pain syndrome, it's more that the pain is the problem. So it's like any chronic pain. um, And we think that essentially that the nerves have got turned on and they've not got turned off. So it's kind of like evil surgeons like me come in and take the breast tissue away and that cuts the nerves through to the breast and the skin and you're left with a constant burning, kind of like an electric shock sensation and it's not like any other pain I've had and it doesn't go away and paracetamol doesn't touch it and I couldn't wear a bra because my skin was so sensitive. So some people will experience skin sensitivity and other people will feel it sort of more deep inside. And they use the words that that you just used, gnawing, burning, as opposed to aching. And so it feels different to a muscle pain. And you can get what you were describing, the hyperalgesia, this like sensitivity that even touching is agony. And we often use nerve type painkillers. So some people will get benefit from paracetamol and that's okay if that works for you. But what we don't want to do is go down necessarily a traditional pain killing type pathway if it's not the right type of painkiller and what we need is a nerve type painkiller. And that's where doctors use medicines which aren't originally for what it says on the tin. So we might use tricyclic antidepressants. That doesn't mean that I think that you're depressed. We might use anti-seizure medicines, and that doesn't mean that I think that you have epilepsy. But we use these type of medicines for the treatment of chronic pain. And what they're trying to do is just quiet those nerves down and say, actually, it's okay. And if that doesn't work, then we would refer you to the chronic pain team. And they will try various different medications, but also importantly, they will have access to a pain psychologist because CBT can be really helpful here, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's not that that gets rid of the pain, but it helps you find a way of managing and living with the pain. Yeah. 
And that's what I found. It's permanent. Sometimes you just fed up, but you have to live with it so it can really help. Now, moving on again, Max wanted to know, and I get this a lot, how can you recognize changes in your affected breast? Because it looks so different. How do we know how to examine ourselves? Because like I've had, you can get a local recurrence. You can get a new primary in that breast. So I appreciate that it can be really hard to look at yourself in the mirror and that that takes time. But you own you and you have to know you. You don't have to love it. And I think that that takes a long time. I think that we have to accept it. And that bit takes time too, because we have to grieve what was lost and what was. But the only person who's going to know you as well as you is you. So you have to learn to start looking in the mirror and to start checking, looking and touching until you recognize this is what my breast feels like now or my chest wall feels like now. And then you'll be able to notice when it is different. And when it is different is when I want to see you. And I get that that's hard. And it's even harder if, like me, you only have one breast because you've not got another to compare it to. And it's changing as you go through the menopause and you just don't know what's normal anymore. And that's why checking them every month so you get an idea of what is normal for you can help you work out when something's wrong. And I also think that it's okay to go to the doctor and say, I'm not sure. Because you might have a breast change or a skin wall change and it might be eczema. It might not be a recurrence. It might be something else. And the only way that we're going to know is if there is a change that happens, you go back to your doctor. And we both know that fear of finding something, thinking what if, what if, worrying and worrying. And often the minute you tell someone, the anxiety levels drop because someone else is going to look at it for you. And someone else has to be in charge. And as two doctors with cancer... I know that's something that I struggled with, but someone else has to be in charge of your medicine, but you have to look. And I think that a European beach in the summer holiday is one of the most body accepting things that you can do. And I say this because after my first, you know, one of the surgeries that I've had, my middle son came to me randomly and said, mommy, I think you need to throw away your bikinis. And I said, why? And he said, because of all the scars. And at the time, I said to him what I knew I was supposed to say, which was, I can wear them with a scar. That's some, you know, if someone else has a problem with it, then they have a problem with it. I knew that's what I was supposed to say. So that's what I said. And when he went to bed, I put on those bikinis and I cried. I didn't throw them away, but I put them on and I cried and I thought I can't. But I have. And now what I said to him is what I believe because my changed body tells me I'm still here. And it took me a lot of therapy to say that. But my changed body and those scars show me how resilient it is and how I am still here and how I worked to do that. And that is something to be proud of. So to anybody listening who is mourning, that's okay. That's part of the process. But acceptance is the bit that we aim for because you're still here and your scars and your flat chest or your chicken fillet or your softy or whatever it is shows that you're still here. It does. I couldn't have said that better. And I think you also realise everybody is so concerned about what they look like that no one is actually looking at you. Absolutely. And there's people of all shapes and all sizes on a, on a, on a good beach holiday and, and everyone's fine. Exactly. Whilst I've got you here, I wanted to ask, when should we see our GP after a breast cancer diagnosis? And I know it's hard to see one at the minute, but when I had my recurrence just a couple of months ago, do I need to see them? Do they need to know? Can they help? I don't want to bother them. Can you give us a rough guideline as to what, how you can help us and when we should see you? It's how long is a piece of string because that question will be different for everybody. So if you have cancer, you will be coded on one of our lists as cancer. And, you know, at a minimum, there should be a yearly check by somebody that says, do they have everything that they need? But for me, the point of general practice is to remember that you are more than a breast and a bowel and a bit of radiotherapy and a bit of something else. I am the person that holds all of those bits together because sometimes hospital doctors forget that the ankle bone is connected to the 
What's that bone? What's an ankle bone? <laughs> <laughs> There's loads of them. It's one of those really complicated, annoying joints. Okay. But sometimes the consultants and specialists are so thinking about their bit um, that it's easy to forget what else might be going on. And that is the job of the GP. So yes, whilst there may be targets that say, I have to see you at least once a year or you know whatever else, when you are struggling, I want to know. And actually for most people, if there is a change, I'm going to be your way back in once you've been discharged. And that feels very difficult as a cancer patient when you go from being seen all the time to not being seen is a double-edged sword. I don't want to go to hospital. I don't want to have to have chemotherapy. I don't want, I don't want, I'm going anyway. But the cleaner knows my name and the lady who brings the lunch and, you know, everybody knows my name. And therefore I was safe because I was seen. And then they say three months, six months. I haven't got further than that. but but So breast cancer, it's sealed a year and then five years. Right. And goodbye. And the person who is dealing with what it is like to be a survivor is your GP. And I think that we need to do a lot more work about survivorship because we're getting so much better at helping survivors be. But we need to do more work about what you are left with, especially as what you're left with will be dealt with by your GP. So yes, if there is a problem and you've been discharged from breast clinic and you can no longer just ring the breast cancer nurse and say, I need to come back and that we will refer you again on a two-week wait pathway. And I get that when you've had cancer, that's even harder because the last time, the worst bit came true. But things like fatigue and mental health issues and pain and lymphedema and fertility and premature menopause and all of those things which are related to your cancer, they come via me. And if we need help, obviously, we go and ask for that further. But um, your GP is your first port of call. And really importantly, we know where you live, which sounds really creepy. But when you go to the hospital, especially if what's happening to you is complicated or rare, and you go to what we call a tertiary centre, you might be quite far from home. And that could be if you're on a trial or you're having plastic surgery at a hospital miles away. And so your GP will know what is around locally, your local Maggie Centre, the local support groups, maybe that's through a religious organisation, a charity, a church, but your GP might know those things. Or, and if they don't know, they'll be able to find out. And maybe that will be through the social prescriber that's in the practice or something else. So it's not just about physical medicine or your mental health, but also about where can I help you feel part of something locally and that's what your GP does but for me the most important thing and my most important role as a GP is that I know you for a long time and I'm on your team and I am on your side and you need to feel that and that is one of the big struggles I think in general practice is that it's so difficult because there aren't enough of us and it's difficult for you to feel that we have that sense of ownership But when you walk through my door, you're mine now. And that is what you need, especially, I think, after you've had cancer, when you get discharged, because you still need to feel seen. Yeah. Thank you. I guess the take-home message is don't suffer in silence. Your GP is there for you. No. We all have this desire to be good, good cancer patients. There's no such thing as that. You have to say, otherwise I don't know. So you have to say. Exactly. Exactly. And finally, although I know this might be really scary to hear if you've just been diagnosed, but having breast cancer doesn't mean that you won't get another cancer. And I know several people who have had breast cancer and another cancer as well many years down the line. So can you remind us all what we should be checking every month just to make sure that we're trying to catch anything really early if God forbid it did happen? I mean, it feels like a really unfair double whammy, but it happens. It does. It's like you can get breast cancer again, which is why you need to keep checking the breast. It's just so important. So there are some things that we want you to check every month and there are some things that we don't even want you to wait for a month. So everybody should be checking their breast or chest. Everybody should be checking their genitals. And so that means checking your testicles. We call it steamroll repeat. 
So if you have a partner, steam in the shower or in the bath because that means that the testes drops more into the scrotum and then you roll between your finger and thumb and you're looking for any lumps and bumps. And if you have a vulva, you get a hand mirror and a light and you look, you look from front to back and from outside in, you need to look. And what we're looking at, and often people go, what? Um, but hey, again, you need to know what your normal is and you're looking for any changes and it might be an area that looks white or red or sore or itching. So those are the checks that you need to do, but you also need to know what to look for in everything else. And if we go just from top to toe, skin, any changing mole, we use A, B, C, D, E. So is it changing in appearance? Is the border, instead of being nice and symmetrical, does it look like it's growing off in one direction? Has it got more than two colors in there? And is it getting bigger and evolving, changing? Um, so skin changes. If you have a cough, a sore throat, a hoarse voice for more than three weeks, Three weeks is our general cutoff, and that would also mean if you have tummy pain, a lump in the tummy for more than three weeks, we need to know about it. We want to know what your normal bowel habit is. You might go twice a day, you might go twice a week, both of those are normal. If they change, and they change persistently for three weeks, because sometimes you get diarrhea, and sometimes you get constipated, but three weeks of a change in bowel habit, I want to know about it. And then there's the ones I want to know about straight away. And that is if you've got blood in your poo, if you've got blood in your semen, if you've got bleeding in between your periods or after sex or after the menopause, I always want to know about those. And then the things which are vaguer, but are still important, which is tired all the time, doesn't mean that it's cancer, but we need to check and unintentional weight loss. So I'm not trying to lose weight and my clothes are getting looser. There are lots of reasons for all of those things that I just said that don't necessarily mean cancer, but we just have to check. And I think for anyone with a cancer diagnosis, the fear of recurrence is always in the back of our mind. And if you get used to just doing like a physical check-in every month, it'll help you kind of feel maybe a bit more aware and in control. I think something as simple as checking in the toilet, checking the toilet paper after you wipe, are habits that actually we need to ingrain throughout our lives. And the habits that you get into, they take a while to stick, but once they do stick, they are quite literally habitual. <laughs> so you don't need to think about them anymore. And I think that cancer is so disempowering and that you feel so out of control that anything that you can do to take back that control and to feel empowered is helpful. And saying, my body deserves respect and I'm going to check it is the first step. Love that. Thank you so much, Philip. You've been the most amazing guest. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. I have to say a huge thank you to Philippa for sharing her cancer story and being so honest about just how hard cancer can be when you're a mum. The takeaway point for me is that we can still get problems with our breasts even after a breast cancer diagnosis, which is why it's so important to keep checking them. And that most of us probably need to be re-measured for a good bra that fits. I can't be the only one who got measured at 18 and thought, that's it, that's my bra size for life. And now it's time for something special. It's our poem of the week from the wonderful Donna Ashworth, our podcast poet. Her book, Loss, got me through the dark days when mum died and her new book, Wild Hope. It's just like food for the soul. Her words always comfort me and I hope they let you know that you're never really alone. Over to Donna. I think it's really vital that you remember the sun still shines. No matter how thick the cloud, no matter how many days it's been since you last felt those rays, they are there, battling to reach you, battling to warm the soil and radiate life. And the sun, she is as keen to get to your weary bones as you are to feel her. She is on your side. Believe in her, even when the cloud blocks her out and the world is in darkness. Knowing she's there is sometimes all you need to come back. Always, always there. Always, always will be.
That was just beautiful. I don't know how she does it. That was Donna Ashworth reading her poem, The Sun, from her new book, Wild Hope. If you want to read more of Donna's poems, find out more about today's guest, Dr Philippa Kay, or any of the issues she raised, or you want to send me a question to answer on the show, you'll find all the details in the show notes. Next week, I'm going to give you some tips to help you deal with the psychological impact of breast cancer. It's a huge struggle for most of us, and I'll be joined by the amazing cancer psychologist, Professor Dame Leslie Fallowfield, who will share her words of wisdom. It gives you lots of practical tips and advice as to how you can manage these negative thoughts, turn them into something more positive, and prevent the physical and emotional reactions that you have to those thoughts. I'm Dr. Liz Reardon. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week. So Now I've Got Breast Cancer is produced by Birdline Media.